Good morning, Eastgate family and anyone else who might be joining us this morning. These are some extremely difficult and awkward times, but uh, due to health concerns, we've decided to do this online service. We want to encourage you to uh, participate as much as you can. Monty Burkhart's going to be leading us in song, and we encourage you to sing with him uh, where you're at. And we also encourage you to uh, pray our, with our prayer leaders and um, we just uh, want to give God the glory this morning. And so we invite you to join us as we worship and praise our Heavenly Father together. Our first song will be Higher Ground. I am pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright, but still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Our song before prayer will be Beyond This Land of Party. Beyond this land of parting, losing and leaving, far beyond the losses, darkening this, and far beyond the taking and the bereaving, lies a summer land of bliss, land beyond so fair and bright, land beyond where is no night, Summer land, God is a slide. Oh, happy summer land of bliss. Beyond this land of waiting, seeking and sighing, far beyond the sorrows, darkening this, and far beyond the pain and sickness and dying, lies a summer land of bliss. Land beyond, so fair and bright. Land beyond, where is no night. Summer land, God is a slide. Oh, happy summer land of bliss. If you would, pray with me, please. Our kind and gracious Father in heaven, we are indeed thankful for this time that we have to worship together. Father, we're so thankful for each and every blessing that you give us. We know that all the good things come from thee, Father. Father, this morning as we worship, we want to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us and the blessings that we have through him as we pattern our lives after the example that he left and the words that are left in the Bible. Father, we are a nation that is worried. We're a people that are needing to lean on thee, Father. We pray that you would bless each one that can hear my voice. Pray for those that are throughout the nation. Father, the leaders as they make these decisions that will help us to gain a control. Father, that will bless the country, that we will unite together, Father. We pray that... The ones that are being affected, Father, will be blessed. We pray for the ones that are sick. Father, we pray for the church here as we work together, Father. We pray that we, we will be united. We pray that we would uh, be a light into this community. Father, we pray for the leaders as they make decisions that will help us to go forth into this community. Father, we ask you to be with each one of the congregation, and we pray that you would bless them as only you can, Father. 
There are those that are suffering the loss of their loved ones and that have been sick, and we pray that you would give each one what they need. Father, watch over us and protect us. Forgive us where we fail. In Christ's name, amen. Before the Lord's Supper, we will sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me, it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can fill my deepest woe, who in his sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus, Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. One of the privileges that we have when we gather together is to remember one of the most sad yet glorious days ever the day that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and following, Paul writes these words, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus also in Matthew 18, verse 20 says, Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. This morning, as we take some time to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made, Let's remember that even though we're not all together in one place, that he is still within our midst. Let's pray together. Righteous Father, thank you so very much for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. Father, we know that times are difficult for us right now. But Father, we also know that it was a difficult time for you to watch Jesus suffer and die for us. Father, we can't begin to thank you enough for this. And we pray that as we remember his broken body by partaking of this loaf, this bread, which is to us Christians his body, we pray that we'll do it in a manner that pleases you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's pray again together. Father, we are also mindful of what the author of Hebrews tells us through your spirit, that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Father, we know that Jesus' blood was shed for us so that we could be reunited with you one day. And Father, as we partake of this cup, which to us Christians is the blood of Jesus that he poured out for us for our salvation, we pray that we will do so in a manner that pleases you and that is acceptable to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Song before the lesson will be, We Praise Thee, O God. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, who has bought us and sought us and guided our ways. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. You know, these are some extraordinary times. We're a small congregation, or a smaller congregation, I should say. And uh, when they started talking about limits on the size of groups, I honestly thought that it would never actually get to where it would actually apply to us. And they started talking about groups of 250 or less being okay. And then it lowered down to 100 was the threshold. Then 50. And finally, now they say 10 or more people are discouraged. And I thought it was rather ironic because, quite honestly, we are right smack dab in the middle of a sermon series on fellowship. Kind of weird that this would happen during this particular sermon series. Now, some would say that fear has caused us to stop holding our live services, our services at our church building, and make this extraordinary move to a virtual church service. They say we're afraid of this virus, and we're afraid of catching the virus, and so we don't want to meet together and things like that. But I would disagree with that. I don't think that it's fear that caused us to take this extraordinary step. I think that what caused us, what prompted our shepherds, our leaders to take this step is love. A love for each other and a love for our congregation. Because we love each other, we don't want each other to be sick. We don't want each other to be exposed to to unnecessary risks. And so um, that's really a pretty good example, actually, of fellowship of putting others' needs ahead of our own, of truly, truly loving other people. 
specifically loving our church family. So we're going to continue to talk about fellowship over the next several weeks. I did sort of kind of change the order of the uh, sermons that I'm going to preach in this series simply because I wanted to bring this lesson today today I I wanted to, to talk about this particular aspect of fellowship as we begin this period of, uh, of virtual services and things of that nature. Well, the scriptures teach not only by command, but also by example. And the example of the early church provides insight into ways fellowship can be strengthened. And one way that the early church gives us an example of strengthening fellowship is in the use of the home. I believe a study of the New Testament church shows their success in both evangelism and in building fellowship was partly due to their use of the home. Now to appreciate what I mean, let's begin by observing the use of the home by the early church. And something you need to understand right off the bat is that homes were frequently used in the early church. They were used with much frequency. For example, the church in Jerusalem, and this was especially true during times of persecution. As we see in Acts chapter 5, verses 41 and 42, it says, Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Jesus is the Christ. Did you catch that? They suffered persecution. They were, they were uh, threatened and, and beaten by the Sanhedrin and they left rejoicing and they continued daily from house to house to preach that Jesus is the Christ. You turn over to Acts chapter 12, verse 5, we find out that Peter has been put in prison by Herod. The day before Herod's going to bring Peter out to trial... What's going on? Well, Peter's sleeping between two guards. But what has the church done? The church has gotten together and they were praying, verse 12 tells us. But where were they gathered together? At a church building? No. They were gathered together in a home, in a house. Aquila and Priscilla often hosted the church in their home. At Romans 16, they hosted the church in Rome. In 1 Corinthians 16, verses, verse 19, we find out that they'd moved to Asia, and they were hosting a church in their home in Asia as well. Another example would be Philemon. Philemon verses 1 and 2 tell us that Philemon had a church that met in his home. Paul, when he traveled, he utilized homes in his ministry. For example, at Ephesus... In Acts 20, verses 17 through 21, we read, From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. When Paul is at Rome, imprisoned in, at Rome, in, under house arrest, we might say, Acts 28, verses 30 and 31, it says, For two whole years Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you could say, if we want to try and make an application to our particular time right now, you could say that Paul was quarantined. That he was told, given this house, or rented this house, and he could not leave the house. But yet people came and visited him. And yes, I know he wasn't sick with the virus or anything like that. I understand that. I get that. But 
people, when people came to visit, it, visit him, he boldly and without hindrance taught them about the kingdom of God, taught them about Jesus, taught them about how much God really does love them. And so, my friends, we can still have smaller groups come together in our homes, and we can still maintain that social distance of six feet, you know, but... But when they come and visit us, when, when we talk with people, even though we can't go to quote-unquote church, we can still bring glory to God by using our house, our home, as a way of enriching fellowship and of reaching out to the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So homes were used with much frequency in the first century. But over time, the use of the home began to decline. In fact, we we know that quote-unquote church buildings began to be built as early as the second century. In fact, when Constantine, who was emperor of Rome, uh, was converted in 312 AD, he designated Christianity as the official religion of the empire. And as part of his proclamation, Constantine gave many of the pagan temples to the Christians to use as meeting places. Well, before long, people began to view the building as the church. You and I know that this building where I'm in right now is not the church. The church is the people. But before long, after these church buildings started being built and being designated, people began to view the building as the church. Homes were not used as much as before. Most quote-unquote religious activity was uh, conducted and centered around the building. And such is the case today where most quote-unquote religious activity takes place at the church building. I suspect that this subtle shift of activity away from the home and to the church building contributed to a decline of fellowship among many Christians. Now allow me to share a couple of reasons why the home is important to fellowship. See, the home provides certain things that the church building can't. For example... Uh, there is the limitations inherent to the public worship assemblies. Uh, public worship assemblies are certainly necessary. They are certainly important. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Don't think that what I'm saying is, hey, you know what? You can watch sermons online or services online from your home and, and it's all good and everything. In extreme circumstances, when that's the best we can do, then that's good. But under ordinary circumstances, we need to be getting together. The public worship assembly is very, very important. But there are limits to the degree of fellowship we can have during our public assemblies. For example, there's limits on time. A couple of hours a week don't provide much opportunity to develop meaningful relationships between Christians, let alone a single hour. And especially since the time that we actually spend communicating with each other and talking with each other is limited to maybe a few minutes before. Maybe if you're here for Bible class and then for worship, a few minutes in between and then a couple minutes afterwards. And that's really all of the communication that is able to take place. There's limits on time. There's also limits on intimacy. I mean, simple numbers, even though we're a smaller congregation, simple numbers prevent us from spending much time with everyone. I mean, we either make a choice to spend a a good deal of time or a better amount of time with one or two people, or even a smaller amount of time trying to go around and see everybody and say hi to everyone. It's kind of like, oh, hi, how are you doing? Okay, good, 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 move on, move on. And, and, and there, there's not much time for building of a relationship there and for strengthening the fellowship that we have. The home is important to fellowship because of the limitations inherent to public worship assemblies. The home is also important to fellowship, though also because using homes extend opportunities for fellowship. 
See, we have more time when we're at home. The home's informal and personal atmosphere allows us to visit, to talk with each other, to share with each other, perhaps even to study with each other, to pray with each other. It has The home's atmosphere allows us to have opportunities to ask questions and provide answers and study together. All these things are enhanced when we are willing to open up our homes to one another. But more than just having more time, we also have more intimacy. The home's informal and personal atmosphere allows us to become better acquainted with each other. It allows us to proceed beyond the mere formalities, the mere, oh, hi, how are you doing? I really don't want to know, but just go ahead and say fine, because that's what I'm going to pretend that you said anyway. It allows us to get beyond that, to where we can better know and understand one another. And it allows us to really become involved in each other's lives. It should be easy to see that the opportunities for meaningful fellowship can be increased through the use of the home. To encourage this idea further, let me share with you some suggestions for using the home to build fellowship. And oddly enough, and strangely enough, these ideas can still be used even in today's time. They work especially well when there aren't any limitations, but even when there are limitations on how many people are recommended to get together, you can still do these things. Number one, Practice hospitality. We are commanded in 1 Peter 4 verse 9 to show hospitality. Some versions, though, have that practice hospitality. I kind of like that. I like translating it practice hospitality because practice is not something that you do once and then, you, and then it's done. Practice is something that you do over and over and over again. And that's what we need to be doing with our hospitality, is doing it over and over and over again. Now, certainly not all have the same ability to provide hospitality. Some people have a house that will, would allow them to invite the entire congregation over all at once. Others may have a house that's a little smaller, and they may only be able to have one or two families over at a time. Yet others may best provide hospitality by taking people out to lunch or dinner. But to whatever degree we can, let's practice hospitality. Remember 1 Peter 4, 9 and 10? It says, practice hospitality without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Even if we engage in hospitality only on various social levels. You know, we don't do anything spiritual. It's just getting together uh, to eat or to, uh, to, to talk or to watch a, uh, something on television or, or a movie or what have you on TV. Even if we engage in hospitality only on various social levels, it can help to increase levels of communication in which spiritual fellowship can occur later on. I want you to consider using your home as a place, not just for those, so those social interactions, but for spiritual interaction as well. Home Bible studies with new converts, uh, oh, ongoing studies with other Christians, periodic periods of devotion, such as singings and prayer meetings, etc. You know, for the longest time, our Wednesday night services were called Wednesday night prayer meetings. We would get together and, and, and a lot of prayers might be said. Well, in, the, in this day and age of quarantine and no more than 10 people getting together and things like that, why not on Wednesday I'd invite some people from church over and, uh, allow, and have that time of sharing burdens and needs and so forth with them and then having a time of prayer? I mean, how, how, how exciting could that be? Taking advantage of the fact that, well, no more than 10, but you get, you know, 8 to 10 people together and, and you talk about what's going on in your life and then you pray about what's going on in your life. How exciting could that be? Remember the example of Aquila and Priscilla, 
who, when they were in Rome, they offered their home, their, uh, their home as a, to a, a congregation to meet in their house. And when they were in Asia, they allowed the church to meet in their home and everything. So practice hospitality is one way that we can um, use the home to build fellowship. Another suggestion, engage in visitation. You see, for hospitality to work, it must be a two-way street. We must be willing to accept invitations by others and visit them. Uh, sometimes hospitality is not practiced because people won't accept invitations. You invite somebody over to your home. No, I can't go that day. Okay. So you invite them again. No, I can't go that day. Maybe one more time. No, I can't go that day. And then we give up. Now, hospitality has to be a two-way street. There, there has to be an invitation extended, and that invitation has to be accepted. We should also make efforts to visit those who have special needs. Perhaps even especially in this time period in which we are living right now. The sick, both those who are at home and those who are in the hospital, if the hospital will let you in and everything, or in the nursing home, if the nursing home will let you in, we ought to be visiting them. Those who are visiting those who are new in the faith or otherwise new members of the congregation. We ought to be visiting those who are spiritually weak. That's not just the job for the minister and the elders, okay? Or for the preacher and the elders. All of us are ministers. It is the job of the minister, and you're the minister, okay? So it's all of our responsibility to talk to those and visit with those who are spiritually weak. Making ourselves available to be of service to those with such needs is actually defined in James 1.27 as pure and faultless religion. You know, more could be said. But I hope that it's evident that the use of the home can greatly facilitate the sort of fellowship Christ intends for His church. A fellowship that is a rich one. Primarily spiritual in nature. But also facilitated through practical means like hospitality and visitation. I hope that you can see that our life together needs to extend beyond the walls of the church building, beyond the few hours that we assemble together for public worship. Now, it has been said in times past that Eastgate is a friendly congregation. But let me ask, we may be a friendly congregation, but are we a hospitable congregation? The distinction should be evident which is friendly, describes what takes place inside the church building. Hospitable describes what goes on outside the church building, in our homes, in the rest of our lives. The Lord has blessed all of us to various degrees with our homes. Let's be wise servants. Let us use our homes to the glory of God and to the enrichment of our lives together. You know, at this point in each worship service, typically I or whoever is doing the speaking would offer an invitation, inviting those in, who are in need of prayer or who are struggling or who wish to commit their lives to Christ by being immersed in the waters of baptism to come to the front as we stand and sing. Well, that doesn't work very well when we're online. But we do still want to offer an invitation. YouTube has a comment section below the picture uh, on your computer or that you're uh, watching this on. If you're struggling and or in need of prayer, all you have to do is comment below, I'd like prayers or something to that extent. Now since anyone anywhere in the world can see what you write there. You might want to be careful and keep it as general as possible. But uh, please do that. If you need prayers, do that. Ask for prayers. And uh, please make sure that the name that's shown by your comment is not an online alias so that we know who it is. And shortly after our service time ends, one of our shepherds will call you. And we'll talk with you, get a little bit more details and everything, and then we'll pray with you over the phone for your specific need. Or if you prefer, you can call 
or text one of our shepherds directly, and they'll be happy to talk with you and to pray with you. Perhaps if you're gathered in a small group, maybe you can share your struggles with them, and then together they will pray with you. My point is that if things are not right between you and God, make them right. If that means you need to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, someone can meet you at the church building right away. We don't want to put that off at all. If you just let us know. If that means you need our prayers, then all you have to do is let us know about your need. There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us haste, so oh, haste to his brig. Tis a fount of love from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me. Thirsty soul, hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. There's a rock that's cleft and no soul is left that may not its pure water share. Tis for you and me and a stream I see. Let us hasten joyfully there. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me. Thirsty soul, hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. Our closing song will be God will take care of you. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, with this, we thank you for the day and we thank you for your many, many blessings. Father, we can never thank you enough for all the good things that you do for us. And Father, we just want you to know how grateful and thankful we are that you love us the way you do. Father, we live in a difficult time right now, and with this virus going around and so many people becoming ill and some even passing away, Father, we pray for your guidance for those that are working on some type of a vaccine or a cure for this. We ask, Lord, that you would be with those people and help them to uh, use their minds and their talents that they can come up with uh, something that would work for us. And Father, we ask you to, to bless them. Father, we also know at this time that we would like to remember the family of uh, Bobby Shrimpton, Robin and, and her, her family, and we just ask that you would be with them during this time of loss. Please bless them and help them to get through this difficult time. Lord, we'd like to present uh, Virginia Walburn's name to you. She's going through a very difficult time in her life now with her cancer, and we ask you, Father, to bless her and to bless the hands that are taking care of her, that all will go well with her. And, uh, Father, we ask you to please uh, be with her. Father, we pray for Diane Dozer, who's been having some sugar issues. We ask you, Lord, that, uh, again, that you could help her to get herself balanced uh, in the right frame that she needs to be in. And, Father, we pray for Dottie Siegert. She would continue to be with her and be with Bob and be with those hands that are helping to take care of her. Lord, we know that uh, uh, all things are possible through you. And, Father, we just ask that you would love her and help her, Father, through this difficult time. 
Lord, we again would like to simply say thank you. Father, help us to not look on just the bad things in life, but Father, to appreciate the good. And Father, to be thankful that we have you to call on. And Father, we know we can trust in you and in your name. Lord, we pray for the congregation here. Pray that you would keep us close, Father, and keep us in your will. And Father, we pray that we would be doing the things in this community you would have us to do to spread your name and to grow this congregation of your church. Lord, we know there are others that are shut in. Father, we pray that you would bless them and be with them. And Father, we want to thank you for your many blessings one more time. For it's in your Son's holy name we pray. Amen.